Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. It's the day that you have made. And we thank you that though we can't be together physically as we long to be, uh, that we can be together virtually and we can say hi to each other in the comments. And um, I pray, God, that you would uh, move in our midst, even as we're scattered all over the Bay Area and beyond. I pray, God, that um, as we now turn to your word, that you would reveal yourself to us. I believe with my whole heart, God, that the greater picture we get of you, uh, the lesser we will be uh, desiring things that are around us. God, I believe you are the complete fulfillment of every desire and longing of our heart. And so we ask in this moment that you would reveal yourself to us just a little bit more, that we might catch a glimpse of your beauty and your glory and your majesty. And to that end, God, I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that uh, the message of your word would be clear. I pray that the, the hope and the salvation found in the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, would be clear. I pray that you would quiet our hearts that you would open our eyes and open our ears to see what it is you have to show us and to hear what it is you have to teach us in this moment. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, once again, it is so good to be back with you today, and I'm excited uh, to continue our summer series, which we have called uh, The Church on Mission. Uh, today, we're going to start, and there's no way we could cover it in just one sermon, but we're going to start exploring some big questions about church, like what is it? And what should it look like? And what did God intend for it to be? And so to that end, my, the title of my sermon today is called The Missional Church. The, the Missional Church. Uh, and we are going to look at John chapter 4 for our text. Now, uh, I'm going to read almost the whole chapter. And so I got to hustle. So if you can meet me in John chapter 4, I looked for ways that I could cut parts of it out, but we just need to hear the whole story to get the picture that God is painting for us here. Uh, so I'm going to read from verse 1 through verse 42. John chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 42. Buckle up. It says this, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Probably please, please give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I would like to change the subject. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Just then His disciples came back. They marveled that He was talking with a woman. But no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. 
So the, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Woo. Uh, June 6th, 1946, there was a huge event in Prospect Park in Brooklyn, New York. Tens of thousands of children were there for a parade. They were dressed up in their finest clothes. Uh, it was a Thursday, so school was closed in deference to this parade. On the grandstand for that parade sat the mayor of Brooklyn, the governor of New York, and one of the sitting U.S. Supreme Court justices. What was this huge event that was happening June 6, 1946, that school was closed for, and all these dignitaries were attending? It was the 117th annual Sunday School Parade. Can you believe that? Can you believe a world where a Sunday school parade on a Thursday morning closes down schools and the mayor and the governor of the state and a Supreme Court justice come to it? There was a time in this country where the Christian church had a close and almost symbiotic relationship with the culture in which it resided. I don't think I need to, uh, I don't think it's going to come as a surprise to any of us, especially those of us who live in the Bay Area when I say we do not live in that world anymore. We do not live in a world anymore where culture and the church enjoy a close, a close uh, and amenable relationship. Uh, today, uh, at best, the culture is apathetic towards the traditional Christian worldview. At worst, it is hostile. And in this moment, we are literally watching our culture and society change in ways that we never could have expected. And so the question I want to put before us this morning, as I alluded to earlier, is what is the church and what should it look like? And again, we are not going to be able to cover uh, that, those kind of questions in one sermon uh, on one morning. But, but what should the church be and look like, especially in this moment now where things are so seemingly out of whack? I believe, and I'm not saying this to scare anybody, I believe that we are seeing changes happen to the church that will reverberate for years, if not generations to come. And so I want us to start thinking about in this moment, before we get out of it, what is actually happening and how we might be able to lean into that. I saw a research report this week from a group called the Barna Group, which is a Christian research group. Uh, and they just did a survey that determined that one third of regular church attenders before the pandemic have completely disengaged from church during the pandemic. One out of three people who would have called themselves regular church attenders are not doing virtual church. They're not doing Zoom meetings. They have disengaged from church during this pandemic. And what I think is really interesting about that is it is the younger generations. It is those who are so tech savvy have decided they are not interested in doing church in the way that we have to do church in this moment. So like I said, the church is changing in this, in this cultural moment. And what does that mean? What does that mean for the church? And what is it going to look like? But as I said, and I wanna say this really clearly, I am not worried. I am actually excited about what is happening in the church. Because why? Because history has made clear that in the seasons and the eras of history where the church has enjoyed a close and amenable relationship with its culture and its government, those are the seasons that the church of Jesus Christ has become weak, ineffective, and compromised. But it is the seasons of history where the church has faced significant headwinds, where there has been a cost to call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ, where it has not been easy to be the church. Those are the seasons historically that the church has flourished. And so this morning, 
I want to look at the idea of a missional church. I want to just very broadly talk about what, what is a missional church and what does it look like. And the reason I want to talk about it is because I believe it is the kind of church that God sets forth in this book. And the reason we're looking at John chapter 4 as our text for today is because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the head of the church. And as the head of the church, we can look to him to glean principles of what a church should look like. And I believe that's what we're going to see as we dig into this pretty well-known story of Jesus and the woman at Samaria. So as we turn to the text, the first thing that I want us to see as we think about this idea of what is church and what is a church on mission and what is a missional church is this. The first thing is a missional church goes out. A missional church goes out. As we turn back to our text, we pick this up right at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Uh, he is having really good success. In verse 1, it tells us, Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. That John that is referenced in that verse is who? John the Baptist. So Jesus is baptizing more people than the guy whose name is the baptizer. It's like, it's like if we were like, Jesus was making and selling more computers than Apple. He's having a lot of success in what he is doing. And so what does he do? The very next verse, or the second verse after that, verse 3, he left. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So Jesus is having success. He's starting his public ministry. People are coming. Lots of people are coming. And, and what does he do? He, he doesn't start a building campaign. He doesn't register a 501c3 ministry in his name. Uh, he doesn't start a multi-site baptism video ministry. He leaves. He goes out. Where does he go to? And this is very instructive. Verse 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. That phrase had to in the Greek is day. And quite literally, it means um, what must happen or what is absolutely necessary. So it says it was necessary that Jesus went out and passed through Samaria. And when we get a little bit of cultural context, we see that that is a very interesting phrase. So I, just a quick history lesson. Samaria was the nation, the, the northern kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament. So if we go back to the Old Testament, King David, greatest king in Israel's history, his son Solomon, uh, also a great king, but some not so great things. After Solomon's reign, the kingdom, the nation of Israel is split in two, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Judah is where David's line continued to reign. It's the line that Jesus came from. So northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah, both nations were so sinful that God allowed them to be taken over by foreign nations. It happened earlier for the northern kingdom of Israel. 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel is conquered by the Assyrians. 150 years later, 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah is conquered by the Babylonians. When the northern kingdom of Israel is conquered by the Assyrians, the Assyrians were brutal. Their reputation for, for conquering other nations was brutal. And one of the things that they did in order to minimize the prospects of an uprising or a revolt in the nations that they conquered is that the Assyrians would employ a repopulation strategy. So when the northern kingdom of Israel is conquered by Assyria, they deport a large percentage of the population. And then they import foreigners from all the other nations that they have conquered. And so by the time we get to Jesus' time, John chapter 4, what we're looking at right now, this, this, nation, this place, Samaria, which used to be the northern kingdom of Israel, is a mixed race of people of half Jewish, half pagan ancestry. They are very confused about what they believe theologically. They accept some of the Old Testament scriptures, but they reject others. They have set up, they built their own temple, which for any Jewish person, there's one temple and it's in Jerusalem. And so because of this, the Jewish people hated the Samaritans. They hated them. They thought that they, a Samaritan could not be a witness in a Jewish court because they didn't believe that they told the truth. There was no one they believed was further from God than a Samaritan. And so because of that, when Jewish people in the southern kingdom of Judah wanted to go to Galilee, which was north of Israel, north of Samaria, excuse me, 
they would walk around Samaria. They would extend their trip by days just to avoid walking through Samaria. So when we get to verse four and it says that Jesus had to, it was necessary for him to go to Samaria. That is a significant statement. Jesus is on a mission. He is, he's had some success in his ministry, but he is facing out. He is going out. He is a man on a mission, and his mission is to the people that the Jews think are the furthest possible from God. He is on a mission going out. One of the most um, moving images I've ever seen in my life, and I know this is true for a lot of us, are the images that we get uh, from September 11th, 2001. They are the pictures we get of New York City on that day where hundreds or thousands of people in their business clothes covered in ash and soot and debris are running away from the location of the Twin Towers. But in that moment, the firefighters and the first responders are running against the crowd towards the Twin Towers. They are running to help. They are running, why? Because they are on a mission. Those firefighters and those first responders on 9-11, they were not focused in, they were focused out. And because they had a mission, I mean, it's literally a picture of the gospel. That's not the point of this illustration. But, but you can see in those pictures, those men and women literally going to lay down their lives for the sake of others because they were, they were, they were called to a mission. And that is a picture of what we see Jesus doing in these first few verses. He is, he is running into the place that everyone else wants to run out of. He is going through the place that everyone else wants to go around. And as we think about the church and what the church is and what the church should be, that is the picture of what the church is called to be. A missional church is called to go out. A church on mission is called to face out and to go out. The church of Jesus Christ is not called when it has some success, whatever that looks like, more people are coming, the budget is growing, giving is growing. The the church of Jesus Christ is not called to circle the wagons and start to feel like an insular country club uh, where we, we run programs that make us feel better and we hang out with other Christians all the time. The message is for, that the call on the church of Jesus Christ is that It is on a mission, and that mission is for it to go out. It is to go toward when others are going away. It is to go through when others are going around. The the mission of the missions to the church is not what we do. It is what we are. This is a missional organization that God has called to go out. Now, the church is not called just to go out for the sake of going out. The church is called to go out Because, point number two, a missional church engages others on their turf. A missional church, a church on mission, engages others on their turf. As as we turn back to the text, I want us to see that in verse six, Jesus gets to this town, or he's outside of this town in Samaria, and he comes to Jacob's well, and we're told that it's about the sixth hour. And he meets this woman at the well, who is there coming to get water. Now, we see in verse six, the sixth hour, and I have a footnote, I'm sure many of you do in your Bible, that says that's noon. That's very interesting, and there's a reason it's in the text. Why is it there? Because in, in, that, in that time, in that culture, in today's culture, if you live in a hot climate and you have to go get water from a well, you don't go at noon. It's the heat of the day. You go first thing in the morning or you go in the evening when it's cooler. And so why is this woman at the well at noon? Because she doesn't want to be there with anybody else. She doesn't want to have to be around the other women who are getting water. She doesn't want to have to hear them whispering about her, see the sideways glances. She doesn't want to have to hear the catty comments. Why? Because as we find out a few verses later, Jesus tells her in verse 18 that she has had five husbands. And the man she's living with now is not her husband. And now initially when we read that, we think she's kind of morally loose and that may be the case. But what we need to understand again, culturally at that time, it was virtually impossible for a woman to initiate a divorce. And so when we hear that she has had five husbands, more likely than not, that means that five times a man has married her and then at some point told her he doesn't want her anymore. And so she's coming to the well at noon because she is full of shame. She is, she is a social outcast. And if she comes at midday, she doesn't have to interact with all the other people that she doesn't want to have to interact with. And yet here is Jesus. 
He engages her on her turf. He meets her at this well, and everything is wrong with this interaction. Everything is wrong with it. He's a man, she's a woman. They're not married, and here they are talking together with nobody else around. He's a Jew, she's a Samaritan, he's a sinless rabbi. She's a woman who's got a pretty checkered moral past. I mean, he. He's God. He, forget sinless rabbi. He's God. And she's a Samaritan who the Jews would say is the furthest person from God. And yet here Jesus is engaging her. He says, can I have a drink? And notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, hey, um, some buddies of mine and I are doing, we got this great baptism ministry just south of here. And some of the guys are pretty great preachers. Um, and we've got a great marriage ministry that I think would be really a, good for you. You'd probably love it. Uh, you should come check it out sometime. He doesn't say that. He says, give me a drink. Please give me a drink, probably. And he sits there and he talks with her and he talks with her with kindness and compassion and dignity. He doesn't try and get her to go anywhere else. He just meets her on her turf and he treats her like a human being. It's amazing. Uh, some of us will be familiar with uh, the movie Field of Dreams. It is a story about an Iowa corn farmer who starts hearing a voice. And for those who know the movie, you know what the voice says to him. It says, if you build it, they will come. Or, if you build it, they will come. And what the voice is talking about is a baseball diamond. It's saying if you build a baseball diamond in your cornfield here in Iowa, all these old uh, dead professional baseball players, including your dad who had a, you had a bad relationship with, will come start playing baseball on this field. And even as I say that, I'm like, that is a really weird story. But it's a, but it's a great story, really. It's, it's a great story. Uh, if you build it, they will come. And the, the problem in, in the church of Jesus Christ has been that is the mentality that a lot of people have taken to the church. If we build it, they will come. And now maybe, as my opening story told, maybe there was a time in our history where that kind of was the case, where if, if you just built a good building and, and put on a good service, people would just start coming to try and check it out. But that is not the way Jesus did it. And I don't believe that's the way it was intended to be. Jesus did not, when he started his public ministry, start baptizing a bunch of people in the Jordan and then go set up a tent in Jerusalem and hang a sign out front that said, uh, great worship, single origin coffee, 10 a.m. on Sundays, come for a great, come for a great service. No, he, he went out. And he engaged people on their turf. And that is the call on the church of Jesus Christ even today. A missional church, a church on mission, goes out and it engages people on their turf. A, a missional church. Now, certainly ministry happens inside the four walls of the church. But a church on mission recognizes that ministry also happens outside the four walls of the church. Everywhere you are doing life, your, your school, your workplace, your neighborhood, your gym, if you ever go back to your gym. I'm not, I don't think I am. Uh, you, your, your social circles, your home, your family, they are mission fields, especially now. I think what is so amazing about the context that we are sitting in right now is that it is like God in his infinite wisdom, who again is not surprised about what's going on, uh, is in complete control, has been like, hey, I am going to show you in real time that the church is not a building and that you can still be the church, that you can still be on mission when you are not able to go into the church. So many of us right now are present in places in a way that we never would be present if it was not for this global shutdown. We are present in our homes in a way we would never be present in, without this global shutdown. We are present in our neighborhoods in a way that we would never be present in, except for this global shutdown. And, and that is what a missional church does. It goes out of the church and it, and, it, and it brings the message of Jesus Christ and the hope and salvation that's found in him to people who would never come into a church just because it was built there. The, the, the missional church, it faces out, it goes out, and it also engages others on their turf. And then the last thing that I want us to see in this text is that in a missional church, everyone is sent. In a missional church, everyone is sent. Now, there's a long text, and we got to zoom through a lot of it, so forgive me. There's no way we could cover it all. I would love to. Someday we will. Um, 
Jesus is speaking with this woman, going back and forth. Uh, the disciples come back. Verse 27, to my point earlier, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. And she's kind of like, all right, time for me to go. She goes back to her town and she does exactly what we're talking about in this sermon. She becomes, she goes on mission to her town. She says, look, I met this guy. You got to come meet him. I think it might be the Messiah. And after she leaves, Jesus starts talking to his disciples. And look at what he says to them. He says, verse 12, uh, verse 35, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And then skip down to verse 38. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Jesus is like, hey, what I'm doing here is what I'm sending you to do as well. You have a job, you have a mission. The, the fields are white for harvest and I am sending you to reap the harvest. You are going to continue my job and lest anyone be unsure whether that's actually what he's saying here. Let me point us to John 20, 21, the end of this gospel. This is John's version of the Great Commission. It's after Jesus has risen from the dead. It's before he ascends into heaven. John 20, 21, Jesus said to them, that's his disciples, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. He is saying, my job is your job. My mission is your mission. Now, not to be the perfect son of God, sinless savior of the world and die on a cross. Not, I don't want us to be confused. Not that job. But the job of what? Verse 10 of our passage, the job of bringing living water to those who are dying of thirst for living water, I am passing on to you. And for those of us in the church, that sending, that commissioning, that transferring of his job is not just for the pastor and the elders and the deacons and the staff people, it is for everyone. In a church that is on mission, everyone is sent because everywhere we go is a mission field. Uh, Leslie Newbegin, was a pastor and a theologian and a missionary in the 19th century. He is considered one of the foremost missiologists of the last hundred years. And a missiologist is just a fancy word for someone like a biologist, studies life, missiologist studies missions. He wrote prolifically, I'm not sure if that's a word, but he, he wrote a lot about missions and really shaped a whole generation's view on what missions is and, and what, what it looked like. He spent 40 years in India as a missionary, but one of the most transformative experiences of Leslie Newbegin's life was when he returned to England, which is where he was from, from his 40 years of missions work. He was a pastor in India. And as a side note, uh, this has nothing to do with my sermon. It's just fascinating. Uh, he and his wife, when they were done in India, traveled home to England on buses. They went from India to England traveling on buses with a couple of suitcases. That, that blows my mind. But anyway, when he got back to England after 40 years in India as a missionary, what he realized was that his home culture needed missions, needed missionaries just as much, if not more, than, than the land he had gone to in India. His culture had so changed in the 40 years that he was gone. It was now as, as meaningful a mission field as was the far ends of the earth. And remember the, 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 the Sunday school parade in Brooklyn, like that's not the world we live in anymore. We are living in the midst of a mission field and we are all sent. And listen, I just want us to hear this because I, 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 the, the mission of God, the job that he gives us, the fact that he sends us, that we are all sent to bring his, his living water to those that are dying of thirst. It is, not a, um, it is not a Christian checklist item. It's not like a, well, I gotta check off my quiet time for the day, uh, check off 10 minutes of prayer for the day, memorize a scripture verse, and share the gospel with someone who hasn't heard it. That it's not a thing out of obligation. It is the natural outflowing of a life that has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, a life that has drank from the living waters that he says in verse 13, verse 14, excuse me, will be like a spring of living water welling up inside of us. We simply are to live our lives in our homes and communities and neighborhoods and apartment complexes. And, and, and the living water that Jesus Christ has allowed us to drink should just be flowing out of us. We are all sent. 
And what I want to say to us specifically, to Abundant Life today, as it relates to this idea of a church on mission, is I believe that we are uniquely positioned to be a missional church in this, these, this season and in the days to come. So many churches, I don't, I don't know what the percentage is, but so many churches are, are uh, community churches, and that is a beautiful thing. A community church is a beautiful thing where the, the people who go to that church, who are part of that body, come from a tight geographic area. But that is not what we are at Abundant Life. We are a regional church. The people who call Abundant Life home, we are spread out all over the Bay Area. I am always meeting people in our church who tell me the town they're from, and I've never even heard of it. We are, we are all over, and that is, that is God's strategic plan to plant uh, little water carriers who, who are flowing with streams of, of abundant life all over the Bay Area. To, to, we have been sent all over the Bay Area to bring the hope and the salvation and the message of this book to a world that is dying to hear it. And listen, I just want us to hear this. I want us to hear this in this moment. Uh, we live in a place, the Bay Area, that preaches a message to, its, to all of us day in and day out that is just consumed with success and power and influence and money and funding and the next round of funding and IPOs and likes and impressions and influencers and education. And I want us to know, I want us to believe in the depths of our soul that we who know Jesus Christ, we have a better story to tell than the one that the Bay Area or our culture is telling. We, we have the one, we know the one who is the, the object and the fulfillment of every desire and longing of our heart. All of the things that our world tells us will satisfy, they are empty, they cannot fulfill us. And there are, there are so many people who can testify to that, but Jesus Christ can. He is the one who can fulfill. He is the one we desire. He is the one that we long for. And those of us who know him, all we need to do is lift him up and hold him high. And in the, the, our day in and day out life, engage with people on their turf and tell them the reason for the hope that is in us. We have, we have a message that the world around us is dying to hear. And, and a, a church on mission, it faces out, it goes out, it engages people on their turf. A uh, um, church on mission steps outside of the Christian bubble and spends time outside. It spends time in Samaria. And in a church on mission, everyone knows that they are sent, that they have a message that the world is dying to hear. And why? Why, why do we do these things? Out of obligation? No. We do them out of gratitude because all the things that we've been talking about, they are the exact things that Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus is the original missional church. Jesus, he left his comfort and his ease and his security and all the programs that made him feel super good about himself as God sitting on his throne in heaven. And he faced out and he went out and he came figuratively, figuratively to Samaria. If we don't recognize it yet, we are all Samaritans. We are all so far from God. We are, we are all uh, unable to be saved except that he chooses to save us. He faced out and he met us on our turf. And when he meets us on our turf, when he meets us here in, in steeped in sin and unable to save ourselves, he, he, he talks with us and he walks with us with compassion and kindness and graciousness. He steps out, he meets us on our turf. And then when, he, when we come to him, he transfers his mission onto us. And he tells us that we are sent as the father sent him so we are sent. So it is my hope and prayer, Abundant Life, that we will bear the marks of a church on mission, that we will be a missional church because we are all sent and we have the fountain of living waters through Christ's spirit living inside of us that a, that a thirsty world is dying to drink from. Amen. God, we pray. We pray in this strange season where church feels so strange and, um, and so disappointing in some ways that, that you will still feed us through this experience, that, that our time as a virtual community will be a time of equipping, that, that we may um, take advantage of the doors that you open to us. God, may our hearts break for the people in our lives who do not know the hope and the joy and the life and the salvation that is found in you. And may we just long 
to tell that story. May it not be, God, that we're afraid that people will think we are weird. We're, we're weird whether we talk about you or not. I pray, that, I pray that the words of life would just roll off of our tongues. I pray, God, that you would be with those of us who are struggling. I pray that you would be with those of us who are sick, those of us who need healing. God, I pray that you would fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, and that we would, we would strive, we would strive after you like we're striving after nothing else. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace until we meet again or until our Savior comes and then forevermore. Amen. Uh, you are prayed for, you are loved, and you are sent.